good evening, everyone. Welcome to part two of Gene Beach's uh, Highlands History of the Railroad. Uh, we will be having our speaker here start here momentarily. Uh, please save your questions. We will do a Q&A at the end of this like we did last time. Hopefully everything goes smoothly. We're having some people log in late. Uh, as a friendly reminder, I will be keeping people muted so not to distract Mr. Beach, but as for that, here is Mr. Gene Beach. Welcome and thank you for your evening. Thank you, Justin. Um, we're recording again so we can, very good. All right, good evening uh, and welcome. I'm Gene Beach, president of the Highland Township Historical Society. And this is the second of two presentations on the history of our railroad and its impact on Highland's development. Uh, as before, I want to thank the co-sponsors of these talks, uh, the Highland Activity Center and the Highland Township Library. As you'll hear this evening, we have a long history in this township of folks getting together for lectures, debates, plays, concerts, and similar events. So by sponsoring talks and presentations like this, uh, both the Activity Center and the library are helping to continue a, a very old tradition. Now, if you missed our first session on how the railroad came to be, uh, don't worry. It is available on the Highland Township YouTube page, and there are links to it on the Facebook pages for our Historical Society, the library, and the Activity Center. Uh, for purposes of this evening, however, all you really need to know is that the railroad came through Highland in 1871, and in the process brought about a whole host of changes that had and continue to have uh, a profound impact on our township. And among those changes, uh, none were more immediate and visible uh, than its impact on our environment. Uh, for us, the railroad has always been there. So it may be hard to imagine uh, how different Highlands landscape must have looked uh, to folks before and after it came through. But if you've lived in this area any length of time, you may remember what the M59 US 23 interchange used to look like. Uh, and yet all of the old once familiar landmarks, the oasis, the food town, the lumber yard, uh, they're all gone. Uh, it's as if some giant hand swept them all away and plunked down a totally different landscape in its place. And I'm sure the new railroad gave many Highland residents the same eerie feeling. Uh, hills were leveled, uh, low spots were raised, ponds and wetlands were filled in, farm fields were cut in two, uh, the list kind of goes on and on. But perhaps the biggest of all these changes uh, involved where people went to mail a letter or to do their shopping or to attend church or otherwise interact with each other. Prior to 1871, we had two villages or hamlets in Highland Township. The first, known as Highland Post Office, or simply Highland, uh, was located at what today we call West Highland, uh, at the intersection of M59 and Hickory Ridge Roads. This wasn't a planned or platted village, but it grew up uh, organically in the late 1830s at what was then, as now, a major crossroad. And by 1871, uh, when the railroad came through, it had grown to include a post office, uh, a couple of stores, three different blacksmith shops, a wagon shop, a hotel here that was run by Hiram Giddings, and an assortment of homes. The other early village uh, was known as Spring Mills. Uh, and was located at what today is the intersection of M59 and Harvey Lake Road. Uh, it was platted in 1847 uh, with the idea of taking advantage of the water power that was available thanks to Pettibone Creek. And by 1871, it had grown to include a post office, uh, the grist mill, cider mill, uh, several blacksmith shops, stores, a wagon shop, and an assortment of homes. 
Meanwhile, as we can see on this map from 1857, uh, the area around the intersection of Livingston and Milford Roads, what most of us today think of as downtown Highland, uh, was just open farmland. It had a name, Highland Center, spelled with a R-E, uh, since it is roughly in the geographical center of the township. But other than the cemetery, district school, and a collection of larger farms, there was nothing. Uh, no stores, no shops, no churches, uh, not even Roscoe's mobile gas station. Everything of that nature was a half mile over here to the east uh, at Spring Mills. But then came the railroad, and when they needed to decide uh, where to build a depot, this Highland Center area was an obvious choice. It was on a fairly straight and level stretch of the line, so that trains stopping there would have no difficulty starting up again, regardless of whether they were heading north or south. And its proximity to the intersection of Milford and Livingston uh, meant that folks could easily reach it from all directions. Now this depot was located on the west side of the tracks on the south side of East Livingston Road, basically where the Sniffer Station parking lot is today. It was a typical 19th century rural station, uh, one story wood frame with board and batten siding that was divided into three areas. Uh, at the north end, there was a small passenger waiting room uh, that had a ticket window inside that opened into the office that occupied the middle section. That office included this bay window that allowed the station agent a clear view of the tracks both north and south. Finally, at the south end, there was a uh, freight room that included this raised platform, which made it easier to load uh, rail cars with crates or trunks or, or baggage. This particular photo was taken around 1908, and it shows the depot looking southwest. Um, I happen to like this one because it has a pretty good view of the outhouse here in the back. Uh, by the way, we had a good discussion at our last session about these rural depots. And as I said at the time, the Pierre Marquette seems to have had a basic uh, design that they adapted to the local conditions. And to illustrate that, I put together this composite. Uh, so we've got Highlands Depot here in the center. Here's Milford, here's Novi, Rose Center, and Northfield. And as you can see, they're all pretty much uh, the same basic floor plan. Uh, they just scaled them up or down depending on the size of the town and uh, adjusted for the local conditions. Now, you know how it is today. You build a new freeway exit and suddenly there are gas stations, fast food restaurants, and other things popping up all over the place. And oftentimes those new developments uh, grow so big as to take business away from the original town. Well, the same thing happened here with the railroad. Uh, indeed, the development in what we now call Highland Station actually started a year before the railroad was even finished. Uh, after all, it was no secret where the line was going to run and the location of the depot was probably a foregone conclusion. So in the fall of 1870, uh, Henry H. Bush got a head start on things by building what he called the Highland Center House. It was a hotel located on the southwest corner of Livingston and Milford Roads. Uh, this is a view of it taken around 1910. And here's how it looks more or less today. Uh, the second oldest building still standing in Highland Station. And this was uh, an ideal location with the depot just a short walk to the east. Uh, Bush could easily accommodate uh, both rail travelers and people that were taking uh, a stage or a horse and buggy uh, either along Milford or Livingston Roads. Uh, some months before the railroad opened, for example, the editor of the Milford Times uh, took a stroll north along the right of way to see how the construction was going on. And when he got to Highland, he stopped at the Highland Center House, 
And in this item published in May 13, 1871, uh, he talks about the fact that, quote, a more pleasantly located or neater house cannot be found in Michigan, and our friend Bush knows just how to make his guests feel at home. We are glad to learn that he is liberally patronized by the traveling public. Things really took off, however, in early 1872, uh, when Alman Ruggles and Germain St. John filed a plat for a totally new village located between Milford Road and the railroad tracks, uh, extending both north and south of Livingston Road. And this map is from later in 1872. The part that was north of Livingston was originally Mr. Ruggles' property. This part down here was originally Mr. St. John's. Now, as you can see, um, this plat created four new streets. Uh, South Street down here was never actually constructed because there was some challenging topography down there. Uh, two more streets, the developers named for themselves. So we have St. John and Ruggles Street. That left this fourth very short little street in here, and that was named after Governor Henry H. Crapo, uh, who had died just two years before. And as we mentioned in our last session, uh, Crapo was not only a well-beloved governor, but was also the founder of the Flint and Holly Railroad, which later became part of the Pier Marquette, which in turn stepped in and helped complete the Holly and Monroe through Highland. So it's believed that Ruggles and St. John uh, chose that name to honor Crapo, uh, both for his services as governor and for his railroad career. Now, once this plat was filed, Mr. Ruggles lost no time in trying to market it. Uh, starting in early 1872, uh, he ran this advertisement in various issues of the Milford Times uh, for sale. The subscriber, having completed his plat of the village of Highland, now offers to those seeking homes great inducements to buy. The lots are large and eligibly situated near the depot and will be sold low. And if we zoom in on that uh, 1872 map, uh, we see it didn't take long before folks started buying in. Not just homes, uh, but businesses too. One of the first of these was a store on the northeast corner of Livingston and St. John Streets, uh, basically where Maher Feed and Supply is today. And east of it, right up against the tracks, was what they called a produce house, basically a warehouse uh, for the grain, fruit, vegetables, and other things that the farmers were sending to market. Uh, both the store and produce house were originally built by H.H. H. Willover of Fenton, but since he soon sold out to Newton Babcock, I'm going to call them the Babcock store and produce house from now on. Now, I'm not going to give a comprehensive history of Highland Station. Uh, that would take way more time than we have. Instead, the focus tonight is on how the coming of the railroad uh, radically altered our township's physical, economic, and cultural landscape. And the Babcock store makes for a perfect case study. Uh, there were, as I mentioned earlier, already stores at West Highland and at Spring Mills that had served the community for 30 years years or so. But the fact remained that whatever stock they carried uh, had to be brought in by wagon. And if you're driving a wagon back and forth to Holly or Pontiac or Detroit to get your stock, uh, you're going to be selective in the kind of goods you carry because there's only so much room in your wagon and only so much weight that your team can haul. So chances are you're not going to stock cast iron stoves or plows or other heavy bulky things that you may only sell once or twice a year. Uh, if a customer wanted one, he could order it and have you go get it, but it wouldn't be part of your day-to-day -day inventory. Likewise, you're not going to carry more than maybe one or two brands of soap or tobacco, thread, or similar items. But then comes the railroad, uh, followed almost immediately by Babcock's store. And let's consider what Mr. Babcock says 
in the ads that he starts running in the Milford Times in early 1874. The undersigned would respectfully announce to the citizens of Highland and farmers in the surrounding country that he is prepared to sell all articles in the grocery line as cheap as they can be purchased at any town west of Detroit. And he goes on to say, a fine assortment of plows, cultivators, and scrapers manufactured by Messrs. Jackson and Fitch of Fenton, constantly on hand, or as we would say today, low, low prices, big, big selection. And the reason he is able to do that, indeed the one thing that makes Babcock's store different from all of these earlier ones, is that he's right there next to the railroad. He doesn't need to send a wagon to Fenton every time somebody wants a plow or a cultivator. He can keep them constantly on hand because the railroad literally drops them off at his doorstep. And of course, when a farmer delivers his grain to that produce house, he's not going to get back in his buggy and continue a half mile east to Spring Mills uh, to buy tobacco or sugar or whatever. Uh, he's already at Babcock store, which has lower prices and a bigger variety of goods. Uh, it's no different than today. Price, selection, and convenience will win out almost every time. So it's no surprise that by the time Mr. Babcock started running those ads, uh, Spring Mills was fast becoming a ghost town. In early 1874, its post office closed and was moved, where else? To Mr. Babcock's store. And this new village was given the postal designation of Highland Station. Uh, 30 years later, people started complaining the name sounded kind of rustic, uh, but in the years immediately following the railroad's opening, uh, almost everybody welcomed it uh, since they were proud of this new railroad and all of the prosperity that it promised to bring. Meanwhile, Spring Mills not only lost its post office, uh, but its stores and shops, many of which either moved to Highland Station or simply closed. So by the late 1800s, the only things that were left uh, were a handful of homes and the grist mill, which of course was uh, tied to the water of Pettibone Creek for its power. The railroad also took its toll on West Highland, uh, although not quite as fast or dramatic. Uh, I suspect that was because West Highland was more convenient to folks on the far west side, including uh, some people over the border in Heartland. But in the end, it lost out too. Uh, in 1903, the post office at Highland Station took over the name Highland, uh, while the original Highland Post Office was renamed Highland Corners. It hung around for another three years or so, during which it was renamed yet again West Highland, uh, but finally closed in 1906. Now, much the same thing happened uh, up in the northeast part of the township around what today are Clyde Road and Milford Road. That area was informally known as Wheeler uh, in honor of one of our early families. But again, it was just a spread out collection of farms as we can see on this 1857 map. So when folks in that area, particularly in the far northeast corner of the township, uh, needed to post a letter or go shopping or attend church, uh, many of them took White Lake Road east over the border to what was called White Lake Post Office or White Lake Village. Uh, this was a small hamlet that had grown up along what was originally the White Lake Indian Trail uh, at the intersection of what is today Ormond Road. And starting in the late 1830s, a stage line uh, ran through there between Pontiac and Byron. So it was kind of a natural site for a village. And as we can see on this map from 1872, White Lake Post Office at one time had a couple of churches, uh, a school, cemetery, uh, as well as a store that housed the post office, blacksmith, carriage shop, and a number of homes. All of that changed, however, when the railroad came through Northeast Highland, uh, since they also put a depot up there that prompted the platting of yet another holy new village. Uh, like the community, that new village was originally called Wheeler, as we can see on this railroad map from 
around 1872. Uh, but when they came to establish the post office, they had to change the name to Clyde uh, since there was already a Wheeler, Michigan in Gratiot County. So here's another later edition of that same map where you can almost see where Wheeler has been crossed out and Clyde substituted. Now you may wonder why the Flint and Pierre Marquette uh, would put a second depot at Clyde when it already had one at Highland Station just three miles south. And the reason I suspect is that the company understood just how big an area Clyde would draw business from. Uh, remember, the railroad was hauling more than just passengers, lumber, stoves, and soap. Uh, it was also hauling tons and tons of grain, livestock, fruit, and vegetables, not just down to Detroit, but also north to Saginaw and all of those lumber camps filled with hungry lumberjacks who needed feeding. And this area in and around Clyde was prime wheat farming territory. What's more, there were communities both east and west, uh, which since they had no rail service of their own, uh, would naturally gravitate to and use the Clyde Depot. In that regard, there's an interesting letter uh, to the editor of the Milford Times dated October 12, 1872. Uh, the paper had been running stories on all of the villages and towns that surrounded Milford. So the author of the letter uh, took the opportunity to tell you what I know about Clyde. And he says that Clyde is a station on the Flint and Pier Marquette Railroad, seven miles north of your village. It is a point where the travel to and from Heartland, Rose, Parshaville, and the adjacent towns takes and leaves the cars. The railroad company had built a commodious depot here and a post office has been established with daily mail north and south. The travel between this station and Parshaville is considerable and a large amount of merchandise is left at this depot for Parshaville and other points adjacent. And that letter actually goes on to talk about the fact that the grist mill in Parshaville was planning to send out its flour uh, through the Clyde Depot and that a grain broker had recently set up a, an office in Clyde to take in wheat from Highland Rose and, and White Lake. So there was a lot of money uh, to be made by putting a depot at Clyde, even though it was just three miles north of Highland Station. And that in turn explains how Clyde um, quickly grew from literally nothing into a bustling village that at one point looked like it might actually overtake Highland Station in terms of both size and importance. By the late 1890s, for example, the town had a depot, a large grain elevator, a stockyard, hotel, stores, blacksmith shops, church, cider mill, creamery, and dozens of homes. And all of that meant that that old village of White Lake just over the border, um, suffered the same fate as Spring Mills. The store, shops, and post office soon closed up, uh, leaving just a church and a handful of older homes to kind of mark the spot. Uh, if you drive through that intersection of White Lake Road and Ormond today, you get the feeling there may have been some sort of village or hamlet there, but never realize how important it was uh, before the planning of Clyde uh, brought about its demise. Now, so far we have spoken of the railroad as a way of moving people and goods. Uh, what we often forget, however, is that it was also our first information superhighway. This is most obvious with respect to carrying the mail. Uh, in the early days of settlement, mail was initially delivered and picked up here in Highland once a week. Uh, of course, as time went on, the number and frequency of mail runs increased, first by post riders and later by the stage lines. But even if you could finally mail a letter five or six days a week, it could still take two or three days to reach Detroit. Put that same letter on a train, however, and it could reach Detroit in a matter of hours. So having the railroad available to carry our mail greatly improved the speed uh, with which our residents could communicate by letter. In terms of really rapid communication, however, the big innovation involved what one historian has recently called America's first internet. 
This is another photo of the Highland Depot. Uh, and it's one that I frankly had never seen before until someone brought it to me last year and finally allowed me to scan it. And I always try to scan these old photographs at a fairly high resolution uh, so that I can later zoom in and use various image enhancing techniques to see details that may not be obvious at first glance. And in this case, the area of interest is this corner of the building right here and just by the door, which when you zoom in, shows this sign that has the word telegraph. We see a bracket here with these old glass insulators and even the wires heading out to the pole. And while that's a bit fuzzy, I was able to do a Google image search and confirm that that was a sign confirming that Western Union telegraph and cable service was available at the Highland Depot. By the way, uh, in case you don't know, the difference between a telegram and a cable is that a cable is a message sent overseas uh, through one or more of the big transatlantic submarine cables. Uh, so you'd send a telegram to New York or Los Angeles, but a cable to London or Paris. Now, the primary reason that the railroads had telegraphs was so they could better run their own business, uh, such as letting stations up and down the line know about delays or wrecks, uh, coordinating two-way traffic, uh, et cetera. And since they already owned the right-of-way, it was no problem uh, for them to set up a bunch of poles and string the wires. But those same lines and poles could be leased to a company like Western Union, to send and receive telegrams from offices located in almost every rail station and depot across the country. And that was a really big thing. Uh, if a loved one died and you needed to get word to a family member down in Detroit or up in Flint, you could do it even faster than a letter. Uh, if your reaper or some other piece of farm machinery broke and you needed a replacement part quickly before the harvest season closed, you could order it. Or if you were a grain or livestock buyer who was in town and you wanted to find out what wheat or corn or cattle were trading for that morning in Detroit, again, you could do it. Uh, we take that form of rapid communication uh, for granted today, but it was pretty amazing to folks in the late 1800s. Another thing that the railroad made possible here in town was package delivery. Uh, many folks are surprised to learn that the post office uh, itself didn't start delivering packages until the parcel post service came along in 1913. So before that, anything bigger than a letter uh, was shipped using a private express service. And for most towns and cities in the Northeast United States, including both Highland and Clyde, uh, that meant using American Express. This is an entry from the 1875 R.L. Polk, Michigan Business Directory. And as you can see, it indicates that the express service is American. And Mr. Babcock, of course, is the express agent. Now today, American Express is a giant financial services company that issues credit cards, traveler's checks, has a banking division, et cetera. But it started out as a package delivery service, which is why the original logo featured this rather mean looking dog uh, guarding a shipping trunk. And here's another example of it from a 1884 advertisement. Uh, like FedEx or UPS today, Amex had neighborhood offices or agents who would collect outgoing packages, take them to the station and put them on an express car, which was basically a modified passenger car uh, that would allow them to sort and store uh, packages while the train was rolling along. They would then be dropped off at the appropriate depot where the local agent, in this case, Mr. Babcock, uh, would pick them up and hold them for you until you came to claim them. And of course, that worked the other way around as well. If you wanted to send a package to someone in Detroit or New York, you'd take it to Babcock's uh, pay the appropriate fee, and he'd be sure to get it on the right train. So thanks to the railroad, uh, folks here in Highland could suddenly not only travel significant distances with greater speed and convenience, 
but they could more quickly send and receive mail, uh, telegrams, and packages, including things that they ordered from Sears, Roebuck, or Montgomery Ward, which were kind of the Amazons of their day. And all of that gave Highland and Clyde a decided advantage compared to towns east and west of us. Uh, people living in White Lake or Heartland or Parshaville who didn't have a railroad uh, had to come here if they wanted to avail themselves of those services. And while they were here, uh, chances were good that they would also spend some money in town and so further boost our local economy. Now let's shift gears for a second and talk about the railroad's impact on employment. Uh, prior to 1871, almost everyone in this township earned their living through farming, either as a farm owner or hired hand. You had a few skilled tradesmen, such as the blacksmiths, carpenters, the miller, uh, plus school teachers, doctors, and clergymen, but that was pretty much it. Once the railroad came through, however, uh, there were a growing number of men, and some women too, uh, who were able to work at new types of jobs that the railroad made possible, either directly or indirectly. First and foremost were the people that the railroad itself employed. Each depot had a station agent who was in overall charge uh, he's the one who sold the tickets, handled the money, operated the telegraph, etc. And he would usually have one or more clerks or assistants, uh, some of them studying to become agents themselves, uh, who would help cover for him during meals or breaks. There would also typically be one or two able-bodied men or maybe some younger boys who would handle the freight and serve as baggage porters. Here in Highland, our first station agent was Charles H. Adams, who started at age 21, and over the next 15 years became such a well-known and beloved member of the community that there was quite a hubbub when the Pierre Marquette suddenly transferred him uh, without notice. Uh, Adams and his wife are said to have been sitting in their company-owned home one evening when there was a knock on the door and come to find out it was his replacement complete with his wife and furniture uh, ready to move in. Then, of course, you had the section crews that were led by a section boss uh, whose job was to run up and down the line on a hand car, checking for bad ties, cracked rail, loose spikes, or any other issues that required attention. Uh, among the Highland men who filled that role, was my great uncle, Hanno Huff, who's here in the center, uh, and was a section boss. Um, he's got his men on either side of them, and as you can see, they're sitting on a hand car outside a little shack with a lake, I think it may be Lower Pettibone, uh, in the background. Here's another photo of Eno and his crew that was taken in Milford, uh, just north of Commerce Street. And this is a very interesting photo because each man is holding a different tool of the trade. This fellow has a very long pry bar that was used to pull spikes. And I was holding a wooden gauge that you'd lay across the rails to make sure they were four feet eight and one half inches apart. Uh, this fellow's got a shovel for moving the ballast around. This fellow has the characteristic spike hammer with that very long narrow head. And this fellow has a wooden handle with a taper that fit in the socket of this jack that they could use to lift rail if they needed to slide a new tie in it underneath it, or they could also use it to shove the rails in, back into alignment. And finally, you had a handful of Highland men uh, who literally rode the rails uh, as either engineers, conductors, firemen, or brakemen. Uh, another great uncle of mine, Eugene Baker of Clyde, uh, went to work for the railroad and eventually became a conductor on Pier Marquette freight trains. Um, my dad was named for him, so I guess I was indirectly as well. Uh, in any event, I've had a soft spot for Uncle Gene, even though he died years before I was born. Uh, this photo was taken in the early 1900s, possibly here in Highland, and it shows 
Gene Baker on the left here, uh, sporting a suit coat. There's a vest underneath the coveralls, a bow tie, white shirt, and a derby. Now that may seem overdressed uh, for somebody working on the railroad, but it was actually the uniform uh, which identified him as the one in overall charge. Most people think it's the engineer who runs the train. Uh, but in reality, it's the conductor that has the overall responsibility for the equipment, the crew, and the cargo. So he's the one that picks up the paperwork in the morning. He's the one who signals the engineer to either go ahead or back up. Uh, he's the one with the big gold pocket watch to make sure the train stayed on schedule, et cetera. And that bow tie, uh, suit coat, and derby identify him as the one with all those duties. Now, in addition to these new jobs on the railroad itself, there are also dozens, uh, if not hundreds of jobs in businesses and industries uh, that would not have existed in this township, but for the railroad. Let's take as one example, the Highland Pickle Works. Uh, I have another series of talks coming up starting next month that are devoted exclusively to our pickle industry. But for now, let's focus on how the railroad made it possible. Uh, pickles are, of course, a semi-perishable food product that need to be kept immersed in a brine or vinegar solution. And in the 1880s, they were shipped in wooden barrels that held anywhere from 30 to 40 gallons and weighed roughly 250 to 300 pounds. So nobody is going to start mass producing pickles uh, if the only way that you can get them to market is one or two wagon loads at a time. But if you can park a boxcar on a siding next to your factory, uh, there's no problem. And as we know from this old engraving, that's exactly what they did. The view here is looking southeast. So this is Livingston Road running down in the lower left corner. Sniffer Station parking lot is right about here. Here's the tracks. And as you can see, the large two-story building uh, had a loading dock with its own dedicated siding. And to give you a sense of how much that got used, uh, the Milford Times for January 13, 1883, included an item about, quote, a young man named Stiles, who I think is William Stiles Sr., rolled 120 barrels of pickles into a car and set them on end in 60 minutes. So he's loading a barrel of pickles every 30 seconds. Um, I don't know that there's a Guinness Book of Records category for that, but it's still a very impressive feat, and it shows how essential the railroad was to that business. Now think about all the jobs uh, that were suddenly created by just this one industry. You've got men grading and sorting cucumbers, tending the vats, packing the barrels, loading the cars. Indeed, the cooperage shop down here employed as many as 25 men uh, by itself during the busy season. This was, in short, a huge business that pumped a lot of money into the local economy. In 1895, for example, they paid out $3,500 in wages, plus another $9,500 to farmers who were raising the cucumbers. Another major business that the railroad made possible uh, were the huge ice houses that were on the west side of Upper Pettibone Lake. Uh, they were built in the 1890s by F.S. Hubble of Milford. There were seven of them in all, each one measuring 40 by 120 feet. Uh, they had double walls that were hollow in the middle so you could fill them with straw or sawdust for insulation. And altogether, they could hold over 13,000 tons of ice. There was also a two-story dormitory that you can see here to the right uh, that had room to feed and house 90 men during the ice cutting season. Now, folks here in Highland had been cutting ice for their own use uh, for years, but nobody was going to do it as a business uh, if the only way you could move that ice was by horse and, and wagon. But put in a siding 
as we can see on this 1909 USGS map. Uh, and you can now ship all of those tons of ice by rail. In July 1902, for example, the Milford Times reported that they were sending out five to 10 carloads of ice per day. So again, another business that created all sorts of jobs that would never have been possible but for this railroad. That siding, by the way, was taken up when the ice houses burned in 1929. But interestingly, uh, you can still see the old roadbed on aerial photos to this day. Here's one I grabbed from Google Earth, and you can still see that same curve coming through the, the trees. The ice houses would have sat here. Dormitory would have sat here. Kind of interesting. Yet another business uh, that the railroad made possible uh, were these grain elevators, both at Highland Station and at Clyde. Uh, prior to 1871, our farmers either took their grain to spring mills to be ground for local consumption, or they hauled it by wagon to Holly, Fenton, Pontiac, and other markets. But with the railroad, they could now ship by rail. Uh, at first, this meant bagging and dropping it off at the produce houses. Um, but in 1881, uh, the firm of Palmer and Palmer built a true elevator on the south side of Livingston Road, uh, just west of the depot. And this is a photo of it taken around 1910 when Charlie Atkins owned it. So here's the depot. This is basically where Sniffer Station building is today. Um, meanwhile, up in Clyde, uh, there was another elevator built around the same time uh, by David Barrett, uh, which was later acquired by Wilson Baker. And this is a view of that elevator after Baker had enlarged and improved it. It was located on the south side of Milford Road, right where it makes that turn getting ready to cross over the tracks. So this is Milford Road here in the foreground, Railroad Street running that way uh, south. And here's the, the depot. Now, as we'll talk about later, uh, these elevators made a huge difference to the farmer uh, as far as getting his grain to market. But they also created any number of new jobs within the elevator itself. Uh, you needed a manager to oversee the business, somebody to keep the books, somebody to measure away the grain as it was coming in, maybe a mechanic to keep the different machinery in repair and so forth. In particular, these elevators uh, provided one of the few opportunities that women suddenly had uh, for employment outside the home. Now, in that regard, you need to know uh, that among the crops that were grown here in Highland were dried beans, like uh, Great Northerns or Navy beans. The farmer would harvest and shell them and then bring the loose beans to the elevator. But as you might expect, there would still be a fair amount of stems, chaff, and other debris that were mixed in, uh, not to mention beans that may be cracked or spoiled. So beans needed to be picked over, as the saying was, before you could actually use them for cooking. And if you read market reports from this period, uh, picked beans sold for anywhere from 35 to 40 percent premium uh, compared to ones that had simply been shelled. Now today, that whole bean picking operation is automated, but in the 1880s, it was done by hand uh, using simple machines like this. Uh, the raw beans went up here in the hopper. They fell down onto this canvas belt that was powered by the foot pedal. Operator sat here in the back, and as the beans moved along the belt, uh, you'd pick off the chaff and debris and the bad ones from in this box, allow the good beans to reach the end of the belt, fall down the chute and into a, into a basket. Needless to say, uh, this was dull, backbreaking work that didn't necessarily pay all that well. But if you were a young wife or a widow needing some extra income, uh, a job like that could be a godsend. And we know that this happened here in Highland during the time that Smith Seaver uh, owned the Highland Elevator. According to this Milford Times item, Smith Seaver has his head the right way. 
He pays quite a number of ladies for picking beans instead of sending them to Detroit or elsewhere to be picked and thereby helps the place he lives in. But they say he is so bashful that he has delegated W. Fox to attend to the business. Always got a kick out of that commentary. But in any event, again, another type of job uh, that would not have existed but for the fact uh, that there was a railroad that allowed our grains and produce to be shipped out, which in turn made it worthwhile for Mr. Seaver to hire these local ladies uh, to pick his beans. With that, let me give you one last example of a business which, while it had existed uh, before the railroad, really took off in a big way uh, once it arrived. Prior to 1870, we had, as I mentioned, uh, only one hotel here in the township, and that was the one run by Mr. Giddings at West Highland. And it relied on the stage lines that were carrying uh, passengers east-west from Pontiac to Howell or north-south from Holly and Fenton down to Brighton and Ann Arbor. But as we saw, Mr. Bush built his hotel in Highland Station uh, in anticipation of the railroad's completion in 1870. And a couple of years after that, Mr. Babcock uh, relocated his store closer to the center of town. And the lots that that original store sat on there next to the tracks were soon the site of a second hotel. Uh, it passed through several owners until it was finally purchased by James Beaumont, who renamed it the Highland House and who added livery service that rented horses and buggies to any guests that might need one. Uh, the whole thing burned down in 1895, but was soon rebuilt. And this is how it looked from 1900 onward. Uh, Beaumont retired in 1908, after which the hotel again passed through several owners until finally being bought by John Atley, uh, who continued to run it as the hotel until his death in 1935. And as if that weren't enough, uh, there was yet a third hotel in Highland Station, just east of the tracks on the north side of Livingston, uh, between the railroad and Eleanor Street. Uh, it too went by various names over the years, the Old Grove House, uh, the Planter House, but it likewise did a good business until closing in the early 1900s. Meanwhile, up in Clyde, the Roscoe brothers built a combined hotel and store here on the corner of what today would be Milford Road and Railroad Street. Uh, it was known as the Merchants Hotel, uh, and they built it in 1873, so just two years after the line opened. Uh, it was later owned by L.C. Johnson, who ran it until March of 1894 when it burned. Undaunted, uh, Johnson replaced the store here, but built a new merchant's hotel one block south on the corner of Bishop and Railroad Street, as I have circled there on the map. Now, you are probably wondering uh, how in the world Highland could support that many hotels? Uh, who are all of these people that were coming out here with a need for lodging and livery service? Well, since this might be a good time to take a very short break, um, I've got a video that features some fellows that maybe can help us answer that question. So we'll take three or four minutes here. Please leave your screens on and uh, that way you won't need to sign back in. Never City, next station stop, Never City, Iowa. Cash for the merchandise. Welcome back. Uh, for those of you who may never have seen it, the clip we just played is the opening scene from Meredith Wilson's The Music Man. And while it presents kind of an exaggerated and humorous view of traveling salesmen, the reality is, is that they did account uh, for a good share of the hotel trade. Some of these were true door-to-door -door peddlers, such as your Watkins and Raleigh's salesmen who would go around hawking patent medicines and spices. You had Bible and dictionary salesmen, insurance salesmen, et cetera. Uh, others were agents for a particular brand of soap or stove polish or tobacco. 
who wouldn't go door to door, but they would visit the local stores to see if they could convince them to carry their line of product. And finally, you had what today we would call true business travelers. Uh, the grain, produce, and livestock buyers who would visit towns to negotiate contracts for the future delivery of so much wheat, cattle, or fruit. Uh, in addition to these, you also had ministers who would stop here to hold a revival, temperance speakers, and men named Professor This or Dr. That, who would give lectures or put on a magic lantern slideshow, uh, as well as railroad managers and supervisors who would occasionally come to town to plan or oversee any major repairs or alterations on the rail line itself. And all of these folks needed a place to spend the night, uh, possibly rent a buggy from the livery stable and enjoy either a good dinner or a good breakfast in the morning. Going rate for that, by the way, was a dollar a night, including the meal. So here was another kind of business, uh, what today we call the hospitality industry, uh, that the railroad served to promote and in the process provided even more opportunities for folks to work as clerks or cooks or laundresses or the hostler in the barn, et cetera. Now I could go on uh, to describe any number of other businesses and occupations that the railroad made possible, but I'm sure you've got the idea. Um, make no mistake, we were still a rural community and we stayed that way well into the 1940s and 50s. But unlike the first 35 years of our history, we were also now in contact with the rest of the world as well. Uh, we could easily travel both farther and faster. We could send and receive mail quickly. We could send telegrams. We had new industries and businesses that were bringing thousands of dollars into the local economy. And as a result, we enjoyed a fairly rapid increase in our standard of living that probably would not have occurred or been slow to come. And it was all due to the railroad. But of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And so despite all the benefits that we've talked about, uh, the railroad also brought with it all sorts of new problems and negative impacts. Uh, like the benefits, these kind of fall into two basic categories, those directly tied to the railroad per se, and those that were maybe one or two steps removed, but nevertheless, clearly the result of it being here. Uh, let's consider, for example, accidents on the railroad itself. Now, collisions and derailments were not all that common, uh, since the company obviously did everything it could to avoid them. Uh, but they still sometimes happened. And when they did, they were often spectacular, sometimes tragic, and they invariably drew a crowd of onlookers from miles around. Uh, here, for example, is the first of three photos I'll be showing of a big wreck that happened near Clyde uh, by the elevator uh, on August 20, 1912. There was a northbound freight that had pulled off on the siding so that a northbound passenger train behind it could pass. But for whatever reason, the engineer of the freight decided to do some switching while he was waiting. So he uncoupled his locomotive and pulled out on the main line and then headed back south uh, behind the rest of his train. Seeing the passenger train coming up from the south, he then tried to get back onto the siding uh, by way of the south switch, but he didn't make it all the way. And as a result, the locomotive of the passenger train hit the tender of the freight uh, crushing it forward into the engine, which then smashed into the tail end of the freight cars that were left on the siding. And as we learn from this third photo, uh, as well as a Milford Times item that was published on August 24, uh, the fireman on the freight, uh, John Lou Patterson of Grand Rapids, uh, died as a result of this collision. Thankfully, the engineer of the passenger train managed to slow down enough uh, so that both his locomotive and the passenger cars stayed on the tracks and none of the passengers suffered serious injury. But notice all of the people 
Uh, there must be 30 at least in just this one photo. And what's interesting is that this woman at least, and I think there's some others, is holding an umbrella and it's clear it either was or had been raining. You've got kids running around barefoot in the mud. Um, as I mentioned last week, and as we'll see again later, uh, train wrecks were a very cheap form of, of entertainment. Of course, not every accident or mishap was so tragic. Uh, indeed, some of them were almost humorous. In June of 1887, for example, two cars full of fresh fish derailed as the train came through Highland Station, spilling fish all along the tracks for half a mile. According to the Times, the fish were, quote, repacked in ice and sent along as soon as possible, and afterwards the broken cars were put on track, close quote. But remember, this is June. It's hot. And I can just imagine uh, what that must have smelled like. And even though the fish were put on ice, I have my doubts about how fresh they were when they finally reached their destination. Perhaps the strangest accident uh, occurred in June of 1899 as a northbound freight was halfway between Clyde and Rose. There are several wetlands that were up on that stretch that they bridged using long uh, wooden trestles. And just as this train was running over one of those trestles, a bolt of lightning uh, struck a car loaded with oil. I suspect probably coal oil or kerosene. The tanker promptly exploded, uh, dumping hundreds of gallons of burning oil into the water, which then spread all over the pond and set all 200 feet of the trestle on fire, burning the whole thing down to the ground or the water line. Now, at the time, the conductor and one of the brakemen were up front uh, with the engineer. And since the forward part of the train was already over the trestle, it just kept going up to Holly. The rear brakeman, however, was back in the caboose, uh, which rolled to a rather sudden stop. And by the time he could jump down and look up the line, uh, the whole pond was a blazing inferno, leading to him to conclude that the entire train was gone. So as the Milford Times put it, he lit out for Clyde at the best gate that a most thoroughly scared man could command and wired to Saginaw that the whole train had gone to smash and everybody was dead except him. But about the time he reached Clyde, the forward part of the train arrived safely at Holly and the officials were saved a worse scare. And then note this, several hundred people visited the scene of the wreck, some 40 or 50 going from Milford. You know, you get in your buggy, you drive seven miles to see a train wreck. Um, which may be why we still use the phrase a train wreck to describe uh, uh, anything that goes wrong in a spectacular sort of way that attracts attention. By the way, uh, while none of the train crew were hurt in this oil fire, uh, three of the seven hobos that were thought to be on board were never found. Uh, whether they skedaddled or were in fact lost in the inferno is, is unclear. Other less dramatic accidents included things like collisions with livestock, uh, teams becoming scared and tossing out the driver or passenger of buggy, and injuries resulting from people trying to hop on moving trains. Uh, sadly, there was even one case very early on uh, where a gentleman from Highland used a train to take his own life. Uh, I won't go into the details, they were pretty grisly, but it obviously generated a lot of press coverage both locally and in Detroit. Now that tanker fire I mentioned was apparently caused by lightning, but as you might expect, uh, there were also numerous fires caused by the trains themselves. Uh, remember these were steam locomotives that are burning either wood or coal. And there were often times when a red hot cinder uh, would escape out the smokestack and land in the grass or worse yet on somebody's roof. And since our winds tend to generally blow from west to east, uh, the vast majority of these fires were east of the tracks. One of the worst occurred in January of 1906 
uh, when sparks from a passing freight train uh, started a fire which consumed both the pickle factory and the home uh, belonging to the Needham family here in Highland Station. But even if all these cinders and ash didn't cause fires, uh, they could still be carried along by the wind and land on your laundry out on the line or leave a dingy oily film over your windows and walls. And if you've ever smelled smoke from a coal fire, uh, you know that it's pretty pungent, at least until you get used to it. Uh, indeed, it is thought that the phrase wrong side of the tracks uh, came about as a description of the fact uh, that it was the part of town downwind from the railroad, uh, since it was always dirtier and smellier than the better part of town that was upwind. Now, I mentioned hobos earlier, so let me briefly talk about them. Uh, in the early days of railroading, the word most often used to describe uh, folks who hitched a ride on the rails was tramp, followed by vagrant or vagabond. Uh, the term hobo doesn't appear in print until the late 1880s when it starts showing up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but after that, it spread pretty quickly. It's first used, for example, in the Milford Times in 1895. But whatever you called them, uh, it was the railroad that brought those folks here to town where they frequently caused trouble. Uh, if you were lucky, you just woke up one morning to find a chicken missing or some similar petty theft, but there were occasions when things got pretty ugly. Uh, on March 20, 1903, for example, a hobo got off a freight here in Highland Station and went around town begging for food. Uh, that evening, he showed up at the home of Charlie Adams, the station agent, asking to spend the night, but was turned down. Uh, after Charlie then went to a prayer meeting, the hobo accosted Mrs. Adams, who, um, after sending him away, got frightened and went to a neighbor's for a bit. On returning home, she noticed that the house had been broken into and all the doors were locked, so she spread the alarm, and pretty soon the deputy sheriff, along with Mr. Adams and a group of local men, uh, several of them armed, surrounded the house. Uh, they climbed in through a window and they found the hobo at the top of the stairs on the second floor, at which point a fight ensued with the hobo knocking the deputy in the head with a chair and then spending a good five or ten minutes throwing crockery and everything else down the stairs at the at the uh, posse. Uh, in the course of it all, a couple of shots were fired before the uh, fellow was finally collared and hauled off to Pontiac. Needless to say, uh, that incident generated considerable press coverage. Not only did the Milford Times run a lengthy story about it, but this one is from the Detroit Free Press uh, under the headline, Tramp with Nerve. Finally, let me talk about one other negative impact that the railroad uh, brought about, and that is its effect on public health. Um, by way of background, the state of Michigan passed a law in 1847 uh, requiring every township to establish a board of health consisting of the supervisor, clerk, a justice of the peace, and a health officer who was typically a local doctor. And these boards of health had two main responsibilities. One of them was to establish and oversee a public cemetery. And the other, of course, was to investigate any case of infectious disease and take appropriate steps to treat it. Now, here in Highland, our Board of Health records span exactly 100 years, uh, from 1849 to 1949. And this is the cover page of the one and only original record book. And for the first 25 years, those records are devoted almost exclusively to cemetery business. Uh, there was one case of smallpox in 1864, but that involved a Union soldier who had been injured and sent home, and it's likely he contracted it uh, while he was in, in service. Otherwise, there is no mention in those records of any other public health matter during the first 25 years. Starting in the mid-1870s, however, that all changed. 
Uh, the first mention of scarlet fever, for example, is 1875, followed by outbreaks in 1880, 83, 84, etc., as we see here. The first serious outbreak of measles was in 1883, with subsequent outbreaks in 88 and 93. And the first major outbreak of diphtheria uh, was in 1883, followed by outbreaks in 84, 91, 93, and 01. Some of these outbreaks were quite severe, uh, claiming several lives. And there were times when the Board of Health went so far as to build a pest house. Uh, that is a temporary shack or shed that is isolated from the rest of the community, basically four walls and a door where those suffering from a disease were quarantined uh, until they either recovered or died, and they did both. Um, that happened at Clyde, for example, in 1891, um, and the same epidemic that prompted the closing of the Clyde Methodist Church for several weeks. In other cases, families were quarantined in their homes uh, with signs posted in the yard to warn away visitors while the children were um, ordered to stay home from school. So what's going on? Well, the answer I think is pretty clear when you look at the dates. Uh, as our current experience with COVID has taught us, um, an outbreak of an infectious disease requires several things. First, the disease needs some way to be introduced to the community. Uh, a bunch of the farmers who are spending most of their time on isolated farms, socially distanced, um, and who rarely travel outside the community isn't enough. You need folks who are infected uh, coming in from outside, such as traveling salesmen, produce buyers, stockmen, hobos, etc. And it's the railroad that's bringing those people here. Uh, the second thing you need is for the target population to be dense enough to cause community spread. Uh, again, folks scattered around on isolated farms won't do it. But if you build a railroad depot, which suddenly prompts the platting of a new village, which quickly grows to 100 or more people uh, living and working in close proximity, uh, you now have conditions at which the disease can take hold. Some infected person gets off the train, goes to the hotel or store, the clerk catches it, passes it is it along to people who are picking up their mail uh, and pretty soon you've got a, a mini epidemic on your hands uh, all I think thanks to the railroad last but not least uh, let me touch on <clears throat> what may for me at least be some of the more interesting things and that's the changes the railroad arguably made or at least facilitated in what we might call the culture of the township uh, that is to say, how people behaved, how they thought, what they did for fun, and how they otherwise went about their everyday lives. Uh, I realize that's a rather nebulous concept, but I think a few examples will help it, <clears throat> Excuse me, explain what I mean. Consider, for example, the railroad's impact on agriculture. If you were a farmer, and almost everybody in Highland originally was, uh, you understood that there was little point in raising more grain or livestock than you could take to market uh, because anything over and above that was just a waste of time and effort. Now, before the railroad, you had to haul your produce to Holly or Pontiac or even Detroit uh, with a wagon and team. Those places would buy whatever you brought in. Uh, so that wasn't a limiting factor. Instead, the limiting factor was the size of your wagon and how long it took you to get there and back and how much time you had from the start of harvest until the onset of winter. And after a couple of years, you gained enough experience juggling all those factors to know how much of whatever crop or livestock it made sense for you to raise. But now comes the railroad. And with it, those produce houses, elevators, stockyards, and whatnot. And they're all located just a few miles away. In fact, there, with the elevators at Clyde and at Highland Station, there was no point in this township that was more than four miles from an elevator. 
So even though you still have the same wagon and team, uh, you could now take three, four, five or more loads to Highland Station or Clyde or Milford if you're in the southern part of the township in the same time that it previously took you to drive one load somewhere else. The railroad, in other words, <clears throat> greatly reduced, if not wholly eliminated, the constraints of time and distance by bringing the market to you, which meant you were now free if you chose to increase uh, both the amount and the variety of crops that you planted, buy better equipment, hire outside help, etc., and expand your operation to put more money in your pocket. Uh, what's more, the railroad helps you in that process by making it easier and cheaper to buy that new plow from Mr. Babcock or to maybe order seeds from some out-of-state commercial grower that were of higher quality. In short, the railroad greatly expanded uh, the range of what was possible and so allowed, if not actively encouraged, a new sense of what it meant to be a good, successful farmer. And we see this, for example, in the organization of a Highland chapter of the National Grange in 1874, uh, more formally known as the Patrons of Husbandry, uh, the Grange was and still is a fraternal organization uh, that sought to promote agricultural interests. Here in Highland, the membership included many of the township's most prominent farmers who all got together and contributed to build a large meeting hall at West Highland where they would not only hold their lodge meetings, but also a variety of social events like ice cream socials, picnics, etc. We also see this new sense of what was possible when in October of 1875, a group of Highland men got together to discuss the possibility of a cheese factory here in town. Now, as far as I know, nothing ever came of it, but I think it's pretty clear that they would have never even have thought about the idea if there hadn't been a railroad here to carry that cheese to market. And later on, in fact, in 1893, uh, some farmers up in the Clyde area did organize a dairy co-op uh, that operated a creamery in, up there for several years, uh, turning out butter that they shipped off on the railroad. So from 1871 onward, uh, you start to see an increasing number of larger, more productive farms, which when you combine it with all the new jobs we talked about, uh, resulted in a lot more money pouring into the local economy. And as a result, uh, folks began to have both more time and more resources uh, with which to travel, go shopping, take in plays or shows and sporting events in other cities. And that in turn meant that more and more Highland people uh, were being exposed to all sorts of cultural influences they might otherwise have never have encountered, uh, but for the fact that the railroad was here. Indeed, the railroad not only made it easier to do those things, it actively encouraged them uh, by offering so-called excursion rights. So if, for example, you wanted to go see the Sells Brothers Circus, uh, which was touring in Detroit and Flint in May of 1894, the railroad would not only take you there for a discounted rate, but they would include a free ticket to the show. If you were a fan of the new exciting sport of bicycle racing, and there were a lot of people that were, and you wanted to go see the international bicycle meet that was being held up in Saginaw in September of 1893. Why the railroad was happy to take you there at a discounted excursion fair. Or if you just wanted to go to Detroit to go shopping or see the sites, the railroad would often give special rates on, my, on what might otherwise be slow days. Um, after all, when it comes to passenger trains, an empty one costs just about the same to run as a full one. So kind of like the airlines today, it's better to run them full, uh, even if you have to offer discounts. And it didn't take long uh, for the stores and attractions in Detroit to start capitalizing on that fact. Here, for example, is an ad 
that the C.R. Mabley department store ran in the Milford Times in July of 1882. Now, why would a Detroit department store run an ad in the local paper of a little town that was 40 miles away? Well, the answer is right here. Mabley's was the excursionist's headquarters. And if you read the fine print down at the bottom, it says, you should take advantage of the excursion rates on the railroad. Leave your parcels with us and have your baggage checked without extra cost while you look about the city. So it's no surprise that you start reading about families or groups heading to uh, Detroit by train to go shopping or see the sights. Uh, I suppose it's no different than the groups that get together today, rent a tour bus and go to the outlet mall. Of course, the same train that could take you to Detroit or Flint <clears throat> could also bring uh, a taste of the big city out here to you. And so expose you to many of the same cultural trends and influences. Just think, for example, about that traveling salesman uh, getting off at the depot. Chances are the cut of his suit or the way he combed his hair or trimmed his beard was more up to date. Uh, and his speech may have included some of the latest slang, like that word hobo, that folks here had never heard before. And as I said earlier, uh, when we were talking about hotels, uh, the railroad brought more than just salesmen. There was suddenly a constant stream of speakers, entertainers, ministers, and others who would take the train, stop here, appear before a packed house, uh, at the old township hall or one of the old schools or churches. And it turns out that some of these people were actually quite interesting when you dig into their, their story. Uh, in March of 1879, for example, the Times reported that J.B. Stebbins of Detroit will lecture at the schoolhouse at Highland Station, subject, the world's progress, natural and religious. Now, I think there's a typo here, and I think that the speaker was actually one G.B. Stebbins, who was, in fact, a Detroit-based speaker who gave talks all over the Midwest on everything from free trade to uh, spiritualism and to something that he called scientific and industrial education. Um, temperance lectures seem to have been especially popular. Um, in March of 1887, a Miss Boyce of Grand Rapids delivered an excellent address on the temperance question at the New Methodist Church. Well, I did some searching, and it turns out that this was uh, Mrs. Pardon me, Lydia M. Boyce, who was a widow in her 60s and was very active in the Michigan Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, and she served for many years as the state temperance missioner, uh, giving all talks all over the state. One of our most interesting visitors, uh, however, is the one mentioned in this item from the Times on November 25, 1911, announcing that Miss Preston, a colored lady from Detroit, who is a very, very eloquent speaker, was going to give a lecture, temperance lecture, at the Free Will Baptist Church up on Hickory Ridge. Uh, that was this little white frame church that some of you may remember that stood on the corner of uh, Clyde Road and North Hickory Ridge Road where uh, the big church is today. Now, as it turns out, uh, this speaker was Miss Frances E.L. Preston. Uh, who was born a slave in Virginia in 1844. Her father, who was a freeman, uh, somehow managed to bring the family to Detroit in 1855. And in 1880, Frances, who was by then in her mid-30s, enrolled in the Detroit Training School in Elocution and English Literature. She graduated after two years and then spent a year or so touring with Donovan's Tennessee Cabin Singers, which wasn't a minstrel show, but was actually a serious traditional gospel choir uh, that toured the country giving concerts 
uh, in both black and white churches. After that, she became a professional elocutionist, giving dramatic readings in cities and towns throughout the Midwest. Um, I started looking up some things on newspapers.com and found literally dozens of articles um, about her, and every one of them talks about what a very powerful speaker she was. Uh, finally, in 1891, she obtained a position as lecturer with the National Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she also served for many years as president of the Michigan Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Uh, as it turned out, she had previously spoken twice at Milford uh, in the Presbyterian Church back in 1901. Uh, but as far as I know, this was her only visit to Highland. But in any event, a very remarkable lady, and I'm sure it would have been most interesting to, to hear her. Of course, not every out-of-town visitor uh, was as edifying as Miss Preston. In March of 1891, the Times reported that an Indian medicine company is occupying the town hall, selling medicine and giving an exhibition each evening and raking in the ducats. I love that phrase. Now, you got to understand the Milford Highland rivalry goes way back. So in that same issue, the editor of the Times couldn't help gloating a little bit, saying that the Umatilla Indian medicine men folded their tents Monday morning and quietly stole away to Highland Station, claiming to have lost $46 during their four-day stay. Milford is to be congratulated. Now, be that as it may, uh, these and countless other examples make clear that the railroad not only made it possible, but almost inevitable that Highland people would suddenly be exposed to all sorts of new experiences, ideas, and trends. Uh, the railroad did for them what television and the internet do to us, uh, for us by opening a window to the wider outside world. And human nature being what it is, um, it was just a matter of time, I suppose, before many, uh, especially younger folks, started adopting those ideas and trends. If for no other reason than to show that Highland wasn't just some little podunk whistle-stop town, but an up-to-date sophisticated little community in its own right. Civic pride can be a very powerful motivator because you don't want to be embarrassed for your town when that salesman or lecturer from the big city uh, gets off the train. Up in Clyde, for example, as I said, Elsie Johnson uh, built a new store on the site where his original Merchant's Hotel had stood. And the entire second floor of that building was left open to form one large room where you could hold lodge meetings, lectures, have ice cream socials, et cetera. Uh, today, we would call that a meeting hall or a banquet hall. But as we can see from this 1897 business directory, they called it Johnson's Opera House. Now, I'd bet my last dollar that no one ever made a pilgrimage to Clyde to see anything by Verdi or Puccini or Wagner. But just being able to say that your town had an opera house signaled to the rest of the world that you were an up-to-date cultured community. And that comes through loud and clear in this clipping by the Clyde correspondent to the Milford Times in October 1897. The show at Johnson's Opera House Monday evening was well attended, and deservedly so, as the entertainment would have done credit to a much larger town. In other words, Clyde is just as cultured, just as up-to-date, just as hip as any big city. Now, I'm not sure what show uh, that was, but it may very well have been a play uh, put on by one of our dramatic clubs. And when I say clubs, plural, uh, I say that because there were at least three different ones that are mentioned in the time starting around 1890. The earliest two were the Senior Dramatic Company, which appears to have been made up of older adults, and the Highland Amateur Ideal Dramatic Company, which is thankfully often shortened to just the Ideal Dramatic Company. Uh, which seems to have been mostly young people. 
And then around 1895, those names disappear and are replaced simply by the Highland Dramatic Club, which I suspect was a, an amalgam of the two earlier groups. Be that as it may, um, this desire and motivation to put on plays didn't just spontaneously pop up out of nowhere. Uh, indeed, for much of the 19th century, plays and similar forms of entertainment were seen by many small town folks as morally questionable, if not downright sinful. Uh, that's one of the reasons all of these small town venues called themselves opera houses instead of thinner theaters, because it gave them a, an air of respectability and class. And yet, just 19 years after the railroad goes through, so not quite a generation, you've got folks here in Highland who are not only performing in plays, paying to go see the local play, but they're clearly proud of the fact that they can put them on uh, just as well as they did in a larger city. And how did they know what a more professional play looked like? Well, I suspect it was because some of them had no doubt taken advantage of those excursion rates, gone to Detroit or Flint, yielded to temptation, and come away with the realization that not only were such forms of entertainment not as bad as they had previously thought, but they could actually provide an opportunity for the people of the community to come together, socialize with one another, have a good time, and in many cases, raise funds for various causes uh, and contribute to this growing sense of civic pride uh, that the railroad was clearly helping to stimulate. In that regard, it's interesting that one of the earliest news items concerning these dramatic clubs is this one. Milford Times from May of 1891. A new sidewalk has been laid from Main Street to the ME Church. We heartily thank the ideal dramatic club for the favor done unto us Methodists. The senior dramatic club will lay the walk from Livingston Street to the Congregational Church. Let the good work go on. Highland Station is not asleep. Now, since I come from a long line of Methodists, I had to chuckle when I first read that. Uh, John Wesley called the theater the sink of all profaneness and debauchery. And yet here's a self-professed Highland Methodist in the 1890s who is not only thanking the dramatic clubs for the new sidewalk, but is holding them up uh, as an example, as evidence that Highland Station was a wide awake, civic-minded community that you'd be proud of. Highland Station is not asleep. I think that's a profound cultural change. Of course, if you suffered from stage fright, uh, but you still wanted to show that you were one of these cultured, up-to-date citizens, you could always join these guys, the Clyde Coronet Band, which was a group of men from that village who got together around 1890, and they would give concerts at the Opera House, as well as provide music on the 4th of July or at various ice cream socials, picnics, and similar gatherings. Not to be outdone, some young men from Highland Station got together to form the Highland Station Silver Coronet Band. One of the members was my grandfather, Ulysses Beach. And since my family never throws anything away, I still have his band uniform, which my grandson Daniel kindly agreed to model for me. Um, with those fancy heavy brass epaulets and the buttons, that's obviously not something that was made here in town. Instead, my grandfather and his bandmates uh, would have needed to order them from elsewhere. And we know from a diary that Archie St. John kept, uh, the instruments were bought from Thompson Music Company in Chicago. And of course, it would have been the railroad that delivered them here. Now, as you could probably tell, I could talk about this all night, uh, but sadly, we don't have the time. As I hope I've shown you, however, the coming of the railroad uh, brought about some profound changes in our township. It altered our geography by stimulating the establishment of both Highland Station and Clyde. It created new industries and employment opportunities. And by increasing access to the outside world, it brought about changes in how people farmed, 
how and where we shopped, uh, what news we were exposed to, what entertainments we enjoyed, and contributed uh, both directly and indirectly to this growing sense of civic pride. Simply put, the Highland Township uh, of today would be a much different place, uh, but for the fact that this railroad runs through it. Thank you, Justin. Do we have time for any questions or feedback? Certainly. Um, that was very entertaining. I hope everybody enjoyed that. But if you have questions, please feel free to either raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask. I believe uh, Richard here has already done so. So feel free to start us off, Richard. Can you hear me? I'd like to ask uh, uh, Eugene, how frequently did the trains come through Highland? I heard that there were like 11 stops a day in Highland, and I don't know whether those were daylight hours or across the evening for midnight freight. Uh, obviously, Richard, it varied with, with the time period. Initially, there were four, two north, two south. Uh, as the railroad, of course, added its own additional rolling stock, and as the demand for the trains increased, um, typically there would be two locals running each way, um, two express, and an express train wasn't necessarily a through train. It simply meant you, when you got on the train, you had to let the conductor know where you wanted to get off, otherwise they wouldn't stop. A local would stop just automatically. Um, and then you had uh, several freights, north and south. And early in the morning, I'm talking three o'clock, four o'clock, there would be what was called the milk train at one point that would stop here in town. <clears throat> we had a special uh, warehouse south of the depot where the farmers would drop off these uh, 20 gallon pail or cans of milk. Uh, and it would pick those up, take them to Detroit. I, you know, I know that uh, looking at the schedules, at least eight, and it wouldn't surprise me if, let's say, from about 1910 to 1920, that you could have 10 or 11 running. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, folks? Um, if you are comfortable talking on camera, you may also type into the chat, and I can ask for you. Richard, did you have something else? Uh, one of the questions that I wondered about is, would you comment on the Dow train uh, derailment that happened, what, the 80s or so? I can't remember exactly when it was. Yeah. More recent. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, what was interesting about that is that unlike train wrecks in the 1890s uh, or early 1900s, you know, that thing was was hauling hazardous chemicals. Uh, my recollection is, is that there was not an actual spill, but they were worried enough about it that they closed off um, the roads and there were no spectators. Nobody wanted to go see it. Um, of course, Channel Four, as I remember, had a helicopter fly over so they could they could see it virtually, but nobody wanted to go in person. Um, I mean, Dow Dow and the auto companies are what keep that line alive, and um, with the auto companies cutting back, and with Dow <clears throat> having merged with Dupont. Uh, it's anybody's guess how long the stretch here through Highland is going to continue. I can, I can remember that the explorers that I was involved with at the fire station handed out dry ice for about four days. I mean, it was pretty well shut down for a good radius around there. Yeah, I. you couldn't go across the tracks there by what's now D's and... Um, it was certainly the talk of the town, put it that way. And everybody talked about the quote, Dow death train. 
and it and it took them several days to get all those because they had to handle those tankers very gingerly to get them back on the track and then of course they had to go through and make sure that there hadn't been some minor undetectable leak that needed remediation so yeah it was quite an event peter did you have a question yes i do uh jane my uh, wife uh comes from fort huron and she really wanted to know was there ever any connection between this railroad line and the grand trunk well um they were all interconnected I mean, the old Detroit and Milwaukee is now part of the Grand Trunk. Um, and further south, this line connected to another section of the Grand Trunk, which was started out as that Detroit and Howell line. Um, but from a corporate standpoint, no. I mean, they were separate companies. Pierre Marquette was its own and <clears throat> which was Canadian uh, was its own. Thank you. Uh, Diane, did you have a question? This is Guy and Diane. We've got have, have a question for you, Gene. We okay. so thoroughly enjoyed uh, this presentation and last months and looking forward to uh, uh, hearing more of the history of our area. Uh, we're new to the area. Uh, if we were talking to a neighbor uh, about last month's presentation and she showed us a book that I guess was authored by your mother. Was it authored, authored by my aunt. Okay, your aunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at a photograph of it, Our Highland Heritage. Correct. Uh, is, is that book available in any way? Uh, unfortunately, no. We went through two printings of 500 copies each. So there are a thousand of them in existence. Uh, they were printed for the Susque Centennial. And... Um, Unfortunately, the cost today of trying to reprint them because the publisher didn't keep the proofs, uh, so all the photos and everything would have to be rescanned, is is simply prohibitive. Um, it is available at the library. Um, so, and you'll also find it on uh, eBay or A Books. Every once in a while, a copy comes. We have one book available on Amazon, and it's selling for $96. That's about right. Well, okay. And it's, a, it's a great coffee table book. Uh, if anybody wanted to look, look purchase it, we, we were excited to see the one that our neighbor had. Anyway, Gene, thank you very much. We so thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, thank you. Um, John in chat asked, would love to know if you know much more, much about the rodeos that were held at Lone Tree and Hickory Ridge back in the 40s and 50s. Oh, to be candid, no. I do not, unfortunately. I mean, I, this will sound strange. Um, I know more about the 1800s and early 1900s than I do about the 50s, 60s, 70s. I know that that sounds very strange, but it's it's kind of where I focused my own search. Okay. Um, does anybody else have a question for Mr. Beach? Gene, how many years was the ice house business in effect uh, off of Pettibone Lake? I'm sure that was from the 1890s up to the 30s anyway, maybe. Uh, 29 is when they burned. Oh, okay. And it was quite a fire because, of course, <clears throat> one, they were huge buildings. Two, you had all that hay and sawdust used for insulation. And my dad, who, uh, you know, grew up there across the street from the library, 
can remember or remembered as a kid looking out the second story bedroom window and seeing the flames and smoke a couple of miles to the north. Uh, Linda, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, not a question so much. Uh, I apologize to Jean, Jean, because I did not get you those pictures. I can't find where I stored them. Okay. Moments. However, thank you very much. It's very good. Very interesting. Thank you. I had a lot of fun with this one because, you know, unless you sit there and, and dig into it, you don't realize how many things the railroad either made possible or encouraged. And then you start reading the papers and um, you, you just see it kind of unfolding. <clears throat> and I think the same thing happened obviously when uh, 59 went through in 36, that, that was another game changer. Um, ironically, in a sense, it was 59 and, and roads like it that killed off the railroad. Um, I, I think one thing I, of course, we noticed in Melford, the, um, 1923, things were going to be a little tough from there on, but, um, because of the railroad, because of the topography of the area, it brought General Motors to Melford, which in turn ended up employing a lot of people from Highland Melford area. It brought it the same big, railroad brought Ford to Wixom. Exactly. And Ford to Melford. Yeah. And Ford to Melford. Yeah. And more employment. It was amazing. Well, and you know. I mean, maybe it's coincidence, but I don't think so. When is the Milford Times started? It started in February of 1871. Right. That's when someone came into town. And, and said, they, oh. They had a printing machine with them. Right. And Jackson's bought it. I mean. But, but think about it. <clears throat> it makes sense that if you suddenly have railroad access, that you now have a hometown paper. Yeah, because the ability to deliver at places, the ability to get the paper, is suddenly a lot easier, and the ink and the and to <clears throat> bring the Detroit papers out so you can reprint articles from them and so forth. Well, you'd have instead of week old news, you'd have day maybe a day's difference. Right. It was just amazing, and I was amazed how, how far people would travel on these trains. I mean, going out west was nothing. There was an, aw an awful lot of people uh, from both Highland and Milford <clears throat> took advantage of the train to go to Chicago in 93 for the World's Fair. Oh, yeah. Everybody went. And, uh, yep. and they were purchasing land out west for their cattle ranches and different things, and then they'd trains back and forth. Well, and the funny part there is the the Western railroads would run ads in the Eastern newspapers mm -hmm. offering cheap land. Of course, you remember <clears throat> under the uh, the terms of the, of the transcontinental railroads, they were given land by the federal government. Right. And then they'd turn around and sell it. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like Florida swamp land in a lot of cases, but there were people that, that bought cheap man land and went out to Dakota. Mm -hmm. yep. Dakota, Nebraska, oh, right on through. And a lot of them turned around and came back. <laughs> yes. But, you know, think about it. I mean, th this picture of the uh, uh, stage there, that is um, from the old Highland Township Hall on East Livingston. Um, and they had that fancy curtain with all the local businesses and they're putting on a play. Um, and you know, there's 200 people here in town at most and the whole population of the townships only about 2,000, 2,500. 
Um, but but this was the thing to do. This was, you know, being really, really up to date and with it. And they obviously enjoyed it. I mean, almost every week there is, and, and it's in the fall and winter. Obviously you're not doing it in the summer with the heat and plus you gotta help on the farm. But in the, in the slow months, this was how you entertained yourself. Of course, the plays, I've been making a list as I go through the paper. The, the plays were awful. Um, <laughs> they, no Tony Award winners there. I, they are all, all, they fall into three parts. Classic melodramas, often with a temperance theme, farces, or vaudeville slash minstrel type performances. And you know, to give you the name, like one of them is called Is Marriage a Failure? Or that wasn't so bad. Um, another one was called In the Enemy's Camp. Uh, another one was called Three Glasses a Day, which was a temperance play. And, uh, you know, the funny part is every once in a while something would go on. Um, the Highland Band here tried to put on a play one night, and it was one of these melodramas. And in the middle of it, one of the actors caught his toe on the carpet and fell and unfortunately the knife that he was holding went into his leg so they had a a little uh, extra entertainment that night and it <laughs> it not only made the milford times but livingston press published an item on, on it but now they're they're i i've been going through making a list of the plays and then trying to track down the actual scripts on online and read them be fun to do it. Ryan, just jump in with your question. Sure. Oh, thank you. I appreciate everybody and Eugene, your insight. It's great. Uh, I live uh, Upper Pettibone and we enjoy going out in the bowl. And of course we tell the kids stories about the the horse that, you know, fell through the lake and and, and uh, the haunted, the haunted uh, <laughs> the horse, you know, pulling the ice blocks out. Uh, and that's always fun. I, I don't know too much about it. That's about all I've heard myself. Uh, I had that and, uh, you know, I've been in the community for about 20 years, 15 years. Uh, but uh, now Reed Road, that didn't have anything to do with the Dow accident, did it? Reed Road? No. Being, no. Okay. no. Reed Road was closed as a result of a very tragic accident involving some girls from Milford High School. Okay. That was yeah. a very, a very, very steep at grade crossing that was not signaled and which had very poor visibility. <clears throat> and uh, so, so it seems like they did the right thing there and uh, yeah. it's uh, better off separated there. <laughs> you know, the, the, the downside of it is that if you happen to live on the east side of Lower Pettibone, with access off of Pettibone Lake Road, um, you've either got to go all the way to Milford to come north, or you got to take Livingston and go by Dodge 10 and go south. Reed was kind of right in the middle, and uh, it was it was easier for the residents and the fire trucks and whatnot, but it was a terrible crossing. Okay, thank you. And of course, there used to be a crossing at Maribaugh. They took that one out. And Linda, you remember what Liberty had a crossing? Yes. In, in Milford, right by the old DeGarmo. Right. They office. kept building up the tracks there until cars were getting and trucks were getting hung up on the track. Yep. Yep. Uh, had to close that one. That was, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of trouble in crossings. There's been a lot of people that have died trying to get on trains or. Um, people just walking across the tracks and for some reason didn't hear the train, didn't see it, and 
they were killed. A lot of deaths there. Anyone else? Um, we have a couple of people interested in your photographs, Gene. Um, is there some place online that they can find those or are those in your personal collection? How does that work? Um, there are a lot of them that I use here are from our Highland Township historical website. The address you can, I'll give you the short one first, www.highland1835.com or you can go www.highlandtownshiphistoricalsociety.com or just type in Highland Township Historical Society in Google. But if you get on the page, uh, we have a whole section called um, Highland Photo Tour. Um, and we've divided the <clears throat> township into four quadrants. And most of these photos are from that or are on that site. The newspapers, um, of course, Central Michigan has digitized the Milford Times from 1872 up to, I think it's 1911, and that's searchable. Um, and then there is a site called newspapers.com, which is part of Amazon or uh, Ancestry, and that's a subscription base service, but it has the free press and um, Livingston Argus, etc. Thank you. Um, John Van Oppenheim would ask uh, when you graduated high school, if you feel comfortable sharing that. Would I, when I did? Yes. Um, believe it or not, well, I graduated from high school in, in um, let me think now, 71, but believe it or not, Although my parents and my family have been here in Highland for years, I didn't grow up in Highland. My dad moved to uh, Washington, D.C. during the war and um, came back after the war on the GI Bill to get his master's and doctorate at U of M and then moved back to D.C. to work for the Navy. So I was actually born in suburban Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., and went to school there. Uh, graduated in 71, um, but <clears throat> since I was born with maize and blue diapers, I came back in 71 to attend college at U of M and then went to um, law school at U of M and graduated in 78. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, any more questions, anyone? or? Dean, would you talk about the R train that came through Highland uh, for a period of time? I think it was in July, that 76? I can't remember what year it was here. Yeah. Um, R train was a project. I, I can't remember. Was it Federal Council for the Arts? But it was, as I recall, it was three passenger cars, um, which they pulled onto the siding that served the... Um, grain elevator. That siding was behind the depot uh, and basically in here basically ran right through where the Smithers, Sniffer station front porch is now. Uh, and they, they pulled it up there and I think it stayed about a week. Uh, I remember going to to watch it or walk through it and it was, it was fun. Uh, it was fun just to get on a train and whatnot, and it was fun to uh, to see the art. And then another big railroad thing, I remember when, um, I guess it was uh, CSX at the time, or maybe still CNO, I can't remember, but they had one of their steamers. for a good mile away and then hear it rumble through town with a true steam whistle and then I remember in uh, let's see what what year was it it would have been 88 uh, President Bush coming through on a railroad 
um, campaign swing. And my wife and I drove and the kids got in the car and went down to the uh, elevator, parked and Secret Service on both sides of the track. Um, you know, what are you, what are you here for? Well, I got two little kids in tow. You know, we'd like to see the president just go by and uh, manage to get some, some video of that. Anyone else? Peter, did you have another question or? Yeah, I, I, I've got a comment and a question, Gene. One, uh, what makes your presentation so great, and I think I've told you this, you make it sound like you were there. So uh, no disrespect to old. your age, but you 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 present it that way. The other the other question I had, you touched on it somewhat. How how did the the, the railway affect things like culturally within a town around things like religion, uh, the relationship between people, the schooling of children, the the daily life? Was there any direct connection with that? Uh, direct connection? <clears throat> I mean, I, I tried to touch on it. Um, obviously, you had all kinds of people coming out here who would have had no way and no reason to come here but for the railroad. Um, nobody's going to get in a horse and buggy and drive out to some little rural area <laughs> to give a a lecture, but if they can hop on a train, they hit your town the next night, another town, and so forth, that, that's what they're going to do. Um, yeah, I think clearly there was an impact on entertainment, as evidenced by these plays, by these bands. Um, I've always laughed that, you know, between the Clyde Cornet band and the Highland Station band, you would think that Professor Hill came through town. Um, from the music man. But by the way, if you ever want a, a fun look at what life in Highland probably was like, watch the music man. I know it's exaggerated. I know it's fiction, but I'll read things in the Milford Times and go, wow, that's from the movie. I mean, people uh, down in Milford putting on, um, oh, what did they call them? Attitudes. Okay, some woman get on a stage and, and strike a pose, <laughs> like Grecian urn, you know, uh -huh. and people just ate that stuff up. Um, and, and some of these vaudeville acts that would come to town. We had a minstrel show come to Highland, and <laughs> uh, they enlisted some of the local help to, you know, play the supporting roles. The, the other thing that's interesting, and I, I was going to include this, but frankly, thought I was going to run out of time. And I don't know if this is cause and effect or not, but prior to 1871, I know of one person who grew up in this town that actually went to college. And he was a veteran of the Mexican War who went back to school as part of his career. Um, and yet, starting around 1880, um, you see an increasing number of young men either going to college at U of M or MSU or whatnot, or to various normal schools, which were two-year teaching schools like Fenton Normal School or Michigan State Normal School, which became Eastern University. Mm -hmm. And um, I've often wondered you know, just the fact that the railroad is here and bringing people that have college education, you know, you, you're a young fellow and you go, wow, I can, I can earn a living without having to walk behind the plow, right? <laughs> and um, I, I'm sure there was a lot of that modeling that went on. Thank you. Religion, you know, we were, other than the temperance speakers who would come, 
the occasional revivalists that would come, a lot of visiting ministers, but they tended to be within the denomination that was already here. Um, anything else? Anyone else have questions for Mr. Beach? I'm thinking that might be it, so. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I had fun putting it together. So our next one is uh, a month from now, and it's a two, another two-parter on our pickle history. So I hope you will tune in for that. And I would like to thank you, Mr. Beach, for the entertaining and enlightening presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you.